Welcome back! In the previous video, we trained a deep but fully connected neural network. You can find the code on my GitHub profile. The link is in the description. In this video, we'll train our very first convolutional neural network based on the LANET architecture, which is one of the very first convolutional neural networks. First, let's remove this model and design a model from scratch. Instead of a dense layer, this time we'll define a convolutional layer 20 units and a kernel size of 5x5. Five five. This layer will learn 20 filters. Then we'll pass the output of this layer through a ReLU function, like we did in our previous model. Finally, we'll add a max pooling layer with a pooling size of 2x2 two two and has a stride of also 2x2. Two two. This is going to downsample the input by 2 in both dimensions. Let's copy this to have another convolutional block. There's one more thing we need to do here. Since this is a convolutional layer, we do need the spatial information, so we shouldn't flatten the input here. We should also expand the dimensions and the channel axis since the input has no channels and that's not expected. The input is grayscale. We're going to expand this in axis 3. We will flatten the output of the last convolutional layer so that we can feed the output into fully connected layers. Then we'll do that. We'll add a dense layer with 500 units. Followed by another dense layer as the output layer. This part is the same as a traditional fully connected network, like the network we had in the previous example. And we need to change this to input layer. Okay. Now this should work. Okay, let's run this. Let's see what the validation accuracy will be. Last time it was 98%. 99%, not bad. Okay, let's stop training here and play with the model a little bit more. For example, let's add a dropout layer here between the dense layers. This is going to drop out 20% of its inputs. Let's also add a batch normalization layer here. The batch normalization layer needs to know whether we are training the model or running inference to decide whether to use batch statistics or global statistics. Let's have another batch norm layer here and add the boolean training parameter as an input argument. Okay, now let's scroll down and find our model where we call the model and add the new argument that tells our model whether we are training it or just running inference. We'll need to create a boolean placeholder for this input argument. Let's define it here. All right. Now we need to feed the values for this placeholder. Here, for example, we're training the model, so training is set to true. And here in the validation block, on the other hand, we're not training it, we're just running inference, so we're going to feed the value of this training placeholder as false. Oh, there's one thing I forgot to mention. We need to update our optimizer so that the parameters in the batch norm layer get updated properly. I don't know why this is not done by default automatically, but we need to copy these lines of code that is available on its official documentation web page and then paste it here. This will ensure that we're updating the batch norm layers. I know it's a little inconvenient, but it's just a couple of lines of code. Now we can run this. 
But before that, let's first remove the existing checkpoints so that it doesn't try to load the parameters from our earlier model, which is incompatible with this one, and run this again. Okay, good. We still get 99% accuracy. It seems that our modifications didn't break anything. Now we can modify our optimizer to experiment with different optimization techniques, such as using momentum. We can easily replace this plain gradient descent optimizer with a momentum optimizer. For this momentum parameter, a typical value is 0.9 but you can experiment with other values as well. Instead of using a fixed learning rate, we can also define a learning rate schedule that exponentially decays the learning rate over time. This is our initial learning rate. This will decay the learning rate after every 1875 steps, which is equivalent of one epoch for our data set. This decay rate tells the function to decay the learning rate by 10%. And this last argument is to choose whether we want to decay it continuously or at discrete intervals like a staircase. Let's not forget to use this schedule in place of the learning rate we had earlier. And we're ready to use this function. Let's clear the checkpoints again and run this. Well, there's still something wrong. We had 99% accuracy at this step earlier. Maybe the learning rate is too large, considering the additional momentum term that our new optimizer uses. Okay, let's Decrease the learning rate by an order of magnitude and try again. Oh, let's not load the parameters. Let's make a clean start. And run this again. There we have it, 99% again. Okay, let's try one more different optimizer, the Atom Optimizer, which is actually the go-to option for many people. Let's copy this, and then create another function to have an alternative optimizer function. Let's call this optimizer function Atom. And let's change this to Atom Optimizer remove the momentum parameter. Atom Optimizer adjusts the learning rate adaptively for each parameter, so we don't really need a learning rate schedule. I usually use an epsilon value of 0.1 for better numerical stability, but you can use the default value as well. Okay, let's train our model with this new optimizer function. Let's copy this here and run this. We should note that none of the optimizers we use here are universally superior to each other. One might work better than the other for a particular task and vice versa. My two go-to optimizers are Momentum and Atom. Atom Optimizer is usually more robust against the changes in the hyperparameters, but once the model is tuned, Momentum usually leads to slightly better results. Alright, that's all for today. I hope you liked it. Subscribe for more videos. And as always, thanks for watching, stay tuned, and see you next time.